today we're going to talk about moral action, that's moral decision making. How do we make good decisions? Christianity is, is right here, right in your gut, right in your heart. Best person you could ever be, the best version of yourself is created in God's image and God wants you to live in that freedom. You walk out of the confessional forgiven and free. Welcome to Evangelium, the Catholic video series of sharing the gift of the Catholic faith. We're now in a section of the catechism called morality, and today we're going to talk about moral action. That's moral decision making. How do we make good decisions? What's sin? Uh, sin is turning away from God. What is venial sin? What is mortal sin? And then we'll talk also about where we're tempted to sin, how we're tempted to sin, to turn away from God, to turn away from our true selves, really. Uh, and that's going to be, uh, the, we're going to talk about the flesh, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the world, and we're going to talk about uh, Satan himself, the devil who tempts us. But before we do that, let's always begin with this beautiful prayer, a very encompassing prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas that asks for everything we do here to be really in the midst of our life, that we are deeply Catholic in everything we do, reflecting the richness of the faith. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bestow upon us, O Lord, an understanding that knows you, wisdom in finding you, a way of life that is pleasing to you, perseverance that faithfully waits for you, and confidence that I shall embrace you at last. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let me just say how important uh, these series are, especially this series on morality, because we live in a time of relativism. Relativism refers to a doctrine that denies the reality of absolute truth. You know, there's objective truth and there's subjective truth. Subjective truth is saying, um, you like vanilla ice cream, I like chocolate. And uh, we can have an opinion on both of those and they both could be correct. But objective truth is, says there is an absolute truth that, that is uh, universal. And uh, obviously the church teaches universal objective moral truth that is in contradiction to the, the time of relativism that we're in. And there's religious relativism. You know, beginning of this uh, evangelium, we said, who is Jesus, you know, in, in Alpha program? He's just, is just another prophet, another holy man? No, uh, he's unique. And so too is the church unique. Uh, there is no church that is founded by Jesus Christ, but the Catholic church. So it's the one true church. So you can't have relative, religious relativism because that means that everything's the same. Well, it's not. And so we're going to really delve into this uh, mor moral teaching the next few times, the next two times we get together so we can kind of get a perspective on how we can live in a culture that maybe even rejects absolute uh, moral truth. And so to help us, let's look at the film series now. Is this, what is moral action? Moral action, again, we begin with a beautiful definition. A moral action is any action that proceeds from our deliberate will. We have responsibility for such actions, all of which are either good or either. So the beautiful part about a human person, as opposed to a dog or a cat, is we have a will. We can choose. A dog or a cat cannot choose. Their, 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 their instincts are, are driving them. As moral people, as human beings, we proceed with a deliberate will. Now that will can be formed. We can form that will, as we saw last time, in virtue, or we can lose that sense of goodness in vice. And so we make those moral decisions, and they create actions. So a good idea creates a good action, creates a good virtue, creates a good character, creates a destiny, as we said, a destiny in heaven with the Lord. So either good or evil, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, as we look at a moral action. One of the more unique abilities of human beings is directing our own lives. We can make the choice. You make choices every day, a hundred choices a day. Some are insignificant, some are quite significant. We're free to choose our actions. We are not simply determined by our instinct. As I said, animals are determined by their instinct. This freedom enables us to be creative and to choose from any among possible good actions. Genesis says, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden. Do you remember that? That was God's commandment to Adam and Eve. 
And what happened is they chose a moral action, they chose a moral decision opposed to the commandment of God, and they sinned deeply that affected every human heart from then on. So unfortunately, this freedom is also able to choose things that are evil. That's contrary to what is good for us in God's, in God's commandments. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in that day you'll eat, you shall die. And remember the discussion with the devil of you shall not die? He asked, is, is, it, is that true? And they, and they said, well, God said it. He says, you won't going to die. In fact, you'll know what good and evil is. And what happens is that temptation comes and, and they do die, spiritually die. And we know that a mortal sin is a spiritual death. And so rejecting God's commandments, you do die spiritually. So God desires us to choose only what is good for us because he's created us out of love to be his adopted children, free and holy and happy with him forever. That's it. God wants everybody to be themselves in the deepest sense. I think sometimes people think Christianity is something out there. Christianity is, is right here, right in your gut, right in your heart. It's being the best person you could ever be, the best version of yourself, as, as uh, Mr. Kelly says. But basically what you're saying is you are created in God's image, and God wants you to live in that freedom and that holiness, that happiness that he's created you in. God does not, however, force us to do good. As long as we are alive, we remain free to choose. The most amazing thing about Christianity and about the God we worship is he loves us. And love demands freedom. Love demands choice. So you cannot say to me, love me, Father Mike, you must love me. No, I'm going to have to choose to love you. You've got to be my friend, Father Mike. You've got to be my friend. No, that's a choice. That's freedom. Love demands freedom. And so God created us in love. God created us with a free choice. And the effects of these choices are evident in our own human society, as we see in the Garden of Eden. Huh? We have the serpent devil appears in a luminous, attractive color, shows the temptation appears in all kinds of ways. And we're going to talk about those temptations as they come into their life. The woman takes the forbidden fruit and he eats the forbidden fruit. And they succumb to the temptation because it's really attractive. What temptation isn't attractive? Huh? The temptation against God is always a great advertisement. In fact, I don't think we sin and we're going to say, man, I'm going to be... I'm going to be rebellious against God. That's what I'm going to be. I'm just going to hate on God. No, sin is I'm going to get something really good out of this. I'm going to lie a little bit, but the result of this, I'm going to get an increase of wages, or I'm going to, I'm going to do this because it's going to help me. See, I don't think we I sin to think it's going to be bad for us. I think we sin because it's good for us. And that's the, the warpedness of sin. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas, or St. Saint, Saint Augustine said that we are uh, curved in on ourselves, that we always think, we think about ourselves first and how it can serve ourselves. That's kind of the effect of, of original sin. We'll talk about that a little later with a strange word called concupiscence. And it's, it's, a, it's a word that describes the, the effect of original sin, original sin is still with us even after baptism. So, but anyhow, it's, it's like advertisements. Sins are great advertisements. So what is a sin? Let's take a look. You know, even being Catholics for many years, maybe we haven't even thought about what is sin? It, is this, this out here somewhere? But if it affects me, I'd like to know what it's about. Here's a beautiful definition. A sin is a deliberate evil action a thought, word, or deed, or a mission contrary to God's will. A sin is an action that's bad, evil. I can sin in my thoughts, I can sin in my words, and I can sin in my deeds. Thought, word, and deed, huh? Now that's amazing. Now Jesus said, if you, if you commit adultery in your mind, then you've already committed adultery. If you curse your brother in your mind, you've already cursed your brother, huh? And then it's a contrary to God's will. You know, there's two ways to live, God's will and my will. And if my will connects with God's will, actually it's God's will, isn't it? But if my will is disconnected from God's will, then it's turning away from God. So it's the, the way to not sin is to fight the temptations 
to turn away from God to do something in thought, word, or deed is evil. And that's really the Christian life, isn't it? It's a, it's a constant battle, huh? People that don't realize that Christianity is, is, is a strong walk. Uh, it's, a, it's a battle to do good. So, all sins are acts contrary to the will of God. They either pervert some aspect of human nature, that is, he created such as greedy, sloth, lustful action. You remember the seven deadly sins, pride being the first, lust being the last. And, the, and they contravene, uh, contravene some explicit command that he has given us, such as the prohibition against eating the fruits of the tree of knowledge. So commandments are really uh, God saying, you do this, you lose my love. So people say, you Christians, you just go by rules. You just go by commandments. You always talk about breaking rules. And I say, no, sin is breaking the heart of the Father, not breaking rules. The Father loves us so much, he gives us direction like any father gives the kids, the children direction. And when the kid goes off from the direction of the Father, it breaks the Father's heart because he knows some result of that will hurt that child. Well, the same thing with our Father in heaven. He doesn't give us rules to make us less free. He gives us rules to be free, to walk responsibly in his will and in his life. So the root of all sin, we've talked about this, is pride, attempt to make oneself into one's own gods, independent of the order of nature and the obedience we owe to God. You know, you can trace every sin back to that. I want to do my own thing. I don't want God to tell me what to do. I don't want the church to tell me what to do. I don't want anybody to tell me. I'm just going to do what I want to do. And you're a slave to your own will, huh? And, and I, I guarantee you, you're going to have a car wreck. You're going to have a car. I'm going to drive through Palmer, and I'm not going to... Those stoplights, I'm not going to obey those stoplights. I don't want anybody to tell me when to stop. What's going to happen? Your insurance rate is going to go skyrocketing because you're going to hit every car at every stoplight. You see, we, we're limited in many ways. We don't even think about it. For what? For the safety of others and for my safety. So what do you think God is thinking about us when he gives us commands? For our safety, our spiritual safety. Why are there guardrails on huge mountains that have terrible, windy roads to guard us from falling off? And we don't go, curse those guardrails, curse them. No, we thank God for them. We thank God for the commandments that offer us direction. Huh? So mortal and venial sins, I think this is most Catholics kind of know. You know, people say, well, you Catholics, you can't talk about different, uh, different types of sin. Well, the Bible talks about diff different types of sin. So, of course, we can tell that there are different types of sin. Although all sin is evil, not all sin is equally evil. A sin is mortal if the following conditions are present. Now, this is real important because some people go to confession and they say, Father, I, I committed this terrible sin. And I said, well, I don't know if that's that bad. I think you committed a sin, but maybe it's not mortal like you think. So grave matter, what do we do that is our chosen course of action is gravely wrong? So that's really committing a sin against a strong commandment of God. Knowledge, we know full well or should know that this in action is seriously evil. We have to have grave matter, we have to have knowledge that it is grave matter, we have to acknowledge that we're turning away from God and full consent. We freely consent to this action and could clearly have done, and could clearly have done otherwise. So those are the co uh, components of saying what kind of sin was it? What did I do? How, how culp culpable am I? Here, you know, might, you might say, you know, somebody who's an addict, somebody who's an alcoholic, and they're, they're really creating chaos in their life and chaos in others' life, and you say that poor, poor sinner, he is a poor sinner. But the culpability, once the addiction takes over, it's, his will has really started to, to become less involved. It's, it's, the addiction becomes his uh, drive. And so there is a sense of culpability in something that is less culpable when people are in that condition. They really are sick more than you know, even sinners, you know? So uh, alcohol is a sickness. Alcoholism is a sickness, and we say that. And so, yeah, so we have to apply this in all, all cases, and, and, and mortal or venial, either way. 
And so such sin is mortal because it kills the divine life of the soul, deprives the sinner of heaven. The normal remedy for this sin is obviously the sacrament of reconciliation or the sacrament of confession. Anytime, anytime you turn away from God, get down on your knees at that moment, ask forgiveness, and then celebrate that forgiveness in the sacrament of reconciliation. There are other sins. There are venial sins. These do not kill the divine life of the soul, but they do damage and weaken us. Venial sins may be forgiven through confession in the Mass, through the personal presence or repentance. That people don't realize that the beginning of Mass is a penitential rite. It's just not something that says, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. It's actually a prayer asking for mercy. And you, if you're a confiter, you do it at the very beginning, my thought, word, and deed. Through my fault, through my fault, through my misgivings fault. That's a confession. So if you've created a sin, if you have, uh, have sinned in the week, that, you're bringing it to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. And also personal prayer. Still, I would say, uh, confession is a beautiful way to celebrate uh, the fact of God's forgiveness and to be able to say to God through the confessional, these are the things I've done, these are the things I want forgiveness for. So even the uh, venial sins uh, can obviously be brought into confession. But I just want people to know that there are other ways that Lord forgives in, in this uh, in looking at sin. How can we do what is good? So this is a real important thing. One of the consequences of original sin is it's not easy to do what is good. Uh, Augustine said we are curved in on ourselves, so we always think of ourselves. You, I always say this, if I take a picture of a group of people and I turn the picture around, where do you look first? You look for yourself. We're self-centered, and, and that's just how it is. We tend to desire sinful things, a condition called disordered concupiscence. And... Um, St. Augustine said, all sin is disordered love. We love the things too much that we shouldn't, and we don't love enough the important things. So our love is disordered, and therefore we sin. A good conscience formed through the study of moral law, a good example helps us to judge what is right. Establishing good habits in a well-ordered life, avoiding temptations help us. It's only with God's grace, however, that through the sacraments and prayer we can achieve final victory over sin. So conscience formation is what we're doing right now. So you're watching this, your conscience is being pricked maybe in some places. huh? So this is really a beautiful thing. The church teachings is that we form our conscience according to church teaching. Now, I talked about relativism now. If I said, well, that's really not true because every opinion is, is equal, the church is equal to somebody else's opinion, just you get to choose. That's not a formed conscience. You see, that's not formed to church teachings, that's formed to a cultural teaching. And that's why we're saying it's so dangerous in our culture to think like the culture. You have to think like the church. And that transforms your mind to think like Christ. Don't you want to think like Christ? Have the mind of Christ? Romans says, put on the mind of Christ. Don't let this time rule you. Put on the mind of Christ. Think like he thinks. And so that's uh, conscious. Good habits. Again, a habit is a formed virtue. Over and over and over, it's a habit that we can form. A, a good habit is to do an examination of your life. Uh, there, there, during Lent, there's a good time to do um, examination of conscience. Look at the ways in which I've been living the last few months. And, Look at the wings, I want to think things I want to change. And then it's grace, God's grace. God's grace always is behind everything, huh? I can't do it myself. I gotta rely on God and his mercy. So let's just look at a summary. A moral action, and I would say a moral decision, is any action that proceeds from our deliberate will. We have responsibility to such actions, all of which are either good or good. So we have responsibility. Uh, some are less culpable and some are more culpable. Most of us are quite culpable that we make those decisions, good or bad. And that's taking responsibility for our, our mistakes, our sins, and for our gifts. A sin is an evil moral or immoral act of thought, word, and deed, a mission contrary to God's will. Sins are either mortal or venial. Now, I, I want to talk about a mission of sins, because we often think of commission, that's what I com committed, but there's all omission. You know, uh, I think oftentimes of Matthew's uh, gospel at the end of the judgment, you fed me, you clothed me, you visited me, you prayed for me, you prayed with me. All those are actions that I look at my life, well, man, I haven't done those corporal 
corporal works of mercy. That's what the church calls corporal works of mercy. I haven't done those things. I haven't committed really big, big sins, but these are omissions. And so you have to say, okay, Lord, where is it that you're asking me to move out of myself more sacrificially, to be more in line with people in need, to be more in line with people who are broken, more in line with people who need care, compassion, mercy. So those omission sins are pretty important too. And I think oftentimes we let that go and just think, what did I do? Another question, what didn't I do? You see, what didn't I do is also could be a sin, huh? And then a good conscience, and finally, victory over sin. And I, I think some people think, well, there's no victory, but there is always in Christ Jesus. He is victorious. So let's do a little review here. Are you ready? Three conditions of moral sin are grave matter. It has to be serious. It has to be serious, a real denial of God. And then it has to be knowledge. You have to know what you're doing. This is clearly what I'm doing, and I know that I'm doing it. And then finally, what? A full consent. That means I'm doing it and I am going to reject God. So now we're into the mortal battle and victory. And again, I think to myself, I've been at this as a Catholic for many years. And I think, wow, it's still a battle. Yeah, it's going to be a battle till the day you die because there's goodness and evil, because there is temptation, because everything comes against. But the victory is in Christ Jesus, the victory is cross. You always have to remember this, Christ on his cross conquered death. Don't, you may feel the moment of, fear the moment of death, but don't fear death. Death is leading you into new life. He conquered sin, and so you can go to him with your sins, and sins can be forgiven. And he conquered what? The devil. The devil is, as one saint, is chained. Just don't get, if you go, you, you know, you're a dog, there's a dog chained up. Are you going to, and he's barking and he's angry and he's growling. You're going to go up and pet that dog? I don't think so. So the devil is chained up, chained up till the end of times. And he's going to be caught, cast into the, the lake of fire with his other spirits, demons. That's what Revelation says. At the end of time, he'll be cast into the lake of fire. Hell was made for the devil, huh? It's not made for us. We may end up there by our choice. God does not choose to send anybody to hell. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. And so now we just know victory is ours. So now I'm on the victorious side. Christ has already had victory. Now I live in Christ. And then his victory is my victory because I am born in him. So what is the great battle? Okay, the great battle is a struggle between good and evil, which takes place daily in our lives. Our opponents are the world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are the three marks that the church presents that where we get tempted. And all other temptations, we may have many temptations, but they're all kind of put in those three categories. These conspire to intimidate us, to tempt us away from the following Jesus Christ. Our ultimate happiness depends on achieving victory over them. We don't probably think every day we're in a spiritual battle. We don't eat our Cheerios and say, wow, I'm in really a spiritual battle today. No, but we are. I mean, you can't see the angels around you right now, can you? There's good angels, there's bad angels. And they're, and they're fighting for your soul. They're fighting to defeat you. They're fighting to take you down. They're fighting to, to they hate you. The bad angels hate you, because why? I always wondered about this. I read an article, it says, the devil and his angels hate you because they can't choose their future. It's already chosen for them. They are going to hell. You and I can choose our future. And even if we fall into sin, can we choose a future? We can repent and turn away from sin and turn to God. And the devils hate that about us, that we can actually change our future by repentance. Huh? That's why they hate us. That's why they want to destroy us. So they don't want us uh, to have the future uh, that we have, which is, can be a future uh, in, with God in heaven. The great battle is, see, the devil is off. If you remember, the first Sunday of Lent is always the temptations of Christ. He goes driven in by the Holy Spirit into the, into the wilderness, and the devil tempts him. And he tempts him because he wants to destroy. 
And it's interesting, the devil's kind of dumb on this one. He says, if you are the son of God, he doesn't know Jesus is the son of God and he tries to tempt him with things that are pretty absurd because <laughs> this is what's so funny. He tempts Jesus with the word of God, which is the scriptures. Jesus is the word of God. It's tempted the word of God by the word of God. It doesn't make much sense. So Jesus responds by the scriptures and, uh, and defends uh, who he is and who God is. Uh, so eventually Christ uh, in his temptations obviously is victorious and the devil leaves. Well, let's look at the world, the flesh, and the, and, and the devil. The world. These are our senses which uh, Christians uh, understand the world. The first sense is the world is, a, is good since it's created by God. So we, when, when you say this is, oh, the world, get out of the world. No, the world is terrible. It, it's just it's so tempting. No, the world is beautiful and great. It's broken and there are ways in which it can affect us. The world says prestige and pleasure and money and power and sexual a pleasure is everything will make you happy. Well, a lot of that is good, but it's not going to give you eternal life. It's, you can't give yourself to it. And so the world advertises this and, and you lose, if you lose yourself in the world, in these pleasures, then you lose yourself to God because God is our final outcome, our final pleasure, if you would say. So, unfortunately, however, there are not good, evil influences in the world opposed to God's will and good actions. These are influences collectively referred to as the world. The world is our enemy in the sense, uh, the sex of it because it encourages evil, discourages good. So, again, so I, I think, um, again, uh, when we say this, the world of flesh and the devil, the world is good, the world is created by God. Every, everything he said, he says, this is good, this is beautiful. But even the most beautiful thing can be corrupted, can it? it anything can take us down. Uh, if I think that I should take care of my family and that I should earn a good living, that's absolutely necessary. But then I say, I'm gonna, even, I'm gonna spend more money, I'm gonna spend more time earning money than being with my family. That already is a corrupted good, huh? So I lose contact with my kids, I lose contact with my wife, and pretty soon I'm driven to have more and more and more, and I have less and less and less of family. So you think anything can corrupt us in the world. So let's look now at the temptations. Ideas, this is how the, 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 we're tempted in, in the world, for instance. Ideals and slogans, empty pleasures, empty examples, mental persecutions, uh, and physical persecutions. So the ideas and slogans, you only live once. You're your own captain, huh? Empty pleasures, rich and selfish living. I, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you'll die. Yeah, and you'll go to hell. So probably not the best thing just to eat, drink, and be merry. Probably, you know, with a little bit of temperance there. Evil examples, immoral public figures. I wanna follow that person is so great. They've been married seven times and I just think that it's a great life they're living, I'm just gonna be like them. That's pretty crazy. Intimidations, mental persecutions, peer pressure and ridicule. This is really critical, isn't it? When you want to have a moral life and you're, you're, you're a teenager, you're in seventh grade and everybody's doing everything, everybody gets a tattoo and get their hair colored and, and, and you want to do the same thing and, you, and you're getting ridiculed and you're getting persecuted because you're not. And we're just saying, listen, I, I can't because my, bottle's the, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And my parents said it's not a good thing to do. Man, that's a whole different thing, isn't it? Peer pressure and ridicule, even as an adult. Uh, you, you, hear, you hear gossip in the office. And you step back, not participating, but not critiquing. Huh? Or somebody says, oh, you're Catholic. Yeah, yes, I'm Catholic. And you walk away. Because you don't, you don't want to kind of upset the, the boat here that you have a faith that you can share. At that moment, you could share it. But you said, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, because I know it'll be ridiculed. I'm telling you, that has a big play in how we share our faith. And then physical persecutions, unjust laws, physical harm. This is where the martyrs come in. I will not give up my freedom in Christ. You, he already has my life. Take my life. So those are the way in which the world really acts in our, in our life, isn't it, huh? So this is, this is really good stuff to pray about, really good stuff to look at. So let's look at the flesh now. Again, please hear me. 
This flesh is really good. This is, God created Mike Shields in body and soul. I'm not a spirit. He created me in with this body. This body, it's getting older, but it's me. And I kind of like it. And God kind of liked it. He said, he created Adam and says, this is good. And yeah, even she is good. So the flesh is not something that we, we ignore. But the flesh here is, means an enemy that it's concupiscence. It goes by its own desires, its own desires. And so I desire to eat chocolate cake and I eat the whole chocolate cake. And pretty soon I get sick because the flesh will be, drives me into my own desires and, and what I want to fulfill the pleasures of my life. So pleasures are good, thanks created by God. Chocolate cake's great. However, disordered and unrestrained pursuit of pleasure in our fallen condition, risking domination in our life and enslaving us. Huh? In addition, the fear of pain or any prevents us from doing the good that we should do. So we have, you know, we have this desire for pleasure. I'm just going to follow. If it feels good, do it. Now, that's, that's probably one of the bylines today in our culture. If it feels good, do it. Well, yeah. But that really can lead you to some pretty hard, hard, hard things in your life away from God. Huh? And then um, fear of pain. I'm not going to do sacrificial stuff because I might hurt a little. It might be, might be difficult. I might have to give up things, sacrifice. So um, the flesh is here, is the temptations. Uh, disordered desires of certain things, eating disorders, sex or drug addictions. This is where we really have a serious addiction to pornography today. Th this is probably the major addic addiction that I see in our culture because we have dehumanized the, the flesh, the body of another person and made them into an object. You see, you're supposed to love people and use things. Our culture uses people and loves things. That's the opposite of what we're being created to do. We're supposed to love people, use things. We use people and love things. And that's what pornography is, is using another person for our own sexual fantasies. So I say these are disordered desire, desires and come in all kinds of ways. And that's where the twisting of the truth, the twisting of our goodness, the twisting of our flesh then creates uh, uh, problems and sin. So intimidations, disordered fears of certain things, the fear of effort, hostile reactions or sacrifice. These are things that I think, again, fear rules culture. When fear rules culture, you're not going to step out of yourself. You're not going to help another person. You're not going to sacrifice. It's, a, it's an effort beyond yourself. Um, but, you know, love is sacrifice. You have to, if you're love, you're going to sacrifice. You're going to hurt a little. In fact, you're going to hurt a lot. You're going to give up yourself a lot. You're not going to win arguments. You're not going to say, I'm right all the time. No, love demands a sacrifice of saying, I'm sorry, and, and, and making that amends and, and, and begin, being humiliated by our mistakes. And uh, disordered fears uh, is not going to allow it to do, us, to do that. So the devil here, so we have the world, we have the flesh and we have the devil, the, the, the three-pronged ways in which temptation enters into our life. Now, we're talking about temptations, right? We're talking about moving into sin. Temptation is not a sin. Temptation is a doorway into sin, and we have to know that. It, no matter what temptations come into your mind, if you don't agree to them, they're not sins. They're just temptations. In fact, it can be real victories. So the devil and his fallen angels are the spiritual enemies because of their hatred of God and their desire to deserve, uh, deprive us of eternal happiness. Again, what I'm saying is they're not going to be happy. They don't want you to be happy eternally. These creatures also have intellects. They, are, they use their perverted way against us, thoughts, word and deeds, as well as acting directly. They uh, use the world and flesh against us. For this reason, the attacks against Christians often seem to be uh, organized in a strategic way. Well, they are. The, the devil uses our thoughts, uses our, our actions, uses our weakness. He plays us like a fiddle sometimes. He's intellectual, he's in, intelligent but not wise. Uh, there's a big difference. He's intelligent in the sense he, he can see where the weakness is and he can play those weaknesses. So here are the temptations, empty promises. If you will, then worship me and all will be yours. This is a, 
you know, the devil is tempting Jesus. And the problem, again, if you will, it already belongs to Jesus. <laughs> Everything, the whole world kingdoms, and the devil says, if you will, you have all these kingdoms. Jesus kind of looks, excuse me, they're already mine? You're trying to give me my stuff back? It's so funny. This, if you look at the temptation as a kind of a humorous thing, the devil is, in this way, intelligent, but really not knowing who he's talking with. If you will, if you are, so he doesn't know really who Jesus is at this moment. So the beautiful thing about it is we can see the emptiness of promises. The lies. Who is the devil? He's the father of lies, they say. The one who lies constantly. He takes the truth and he twists it. Twists it. So bad becomes good and good becomes bad. And that's what he's good at. So lies seem at, at first to be okay. There's something not quite right about it. Well, if you feel that, that's probably the evil one trying to tempt you. The intimidations, uh, the threats, state threat, the confusion, evil prophets. And I think you can say cultural institutions that could threaten us. Uh, some, if you speak about moral issues today, sometimes you're going to be threatened by the state. You're going to be threatened by the culture. You're, you're going to be called canceled. You cancel culture. You're going to be canceled because you're teaching what the church teaches. And in that cancel culture, you're not going to be appreciated. You're, in fact, you're not going to be approved and you, you'll be canceled. And I know there are people who are speaking out morally in issues today and that are being canceled on, on, on internet and on Facebook and on other places. So the threats really are, intimidations are real. They are real. You can lose a job uh, if you come up uh, against a certain issue. Uh, you can lose uh, a profession if you say, I can't do this because I don't believe this is morally right. So then the confusion of our time, people are so confused what goodness is, what badness is. It's again, relativity or uh, relativism allows us to say everything is the same and everything can't be the same. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, the person who believes in relativism is the first one to critique when somebody cuts in line in front of him. You see, there is a truth. We all have a truth deep down inside. Relative is not real. It just isn't real. We don't live that way. We may intellectually believe it, but we don't live. There is truth in our life that we follow. So the victory in Christ, all Christians face temptations and intimidations following Jesus Christ. Christ himself said that. Christ himself, however, has conquered the world of relative. Christ said, you are going to face difficulties in the world. But don't despair, I've conquered the world. I've conquered sin. I've conquered the flesh. If we call on God's help and use the aids given the scripture in the church, we have all we need to fight the great battle. In the world, you face persecutions, but take courage, I have conquered the world, John 16. We're in this fight, it's not hopeless. You know, oh man, this life is so, so hard. So what? You've got Christ on your side. This is the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, died for you on the cross, forgiven your sins, redeemed you, called him as your son, called you as his daughter. Excuse me, you've got everything you need to be victorious. Sin does not have to rule your life. You do not have to be lost in your moodiness. You don't have to be lost in your depression. You don't have to be lost anywhere. You don't have to be lost in the lies of your past life. Let, the, let Christ and his victory touch you and heal you and bring you into the present, which is victory in Christ Jesus on the cross. So let's just do a summary again. The great battle is the struggle between good and evil. We have a spiritual battle. Uh, we don't just battle against the flesh and, and we don't have just the world, but we battle about principalities and powers, Paul says. There is ways that I am not actually just tempting by my own thoughts, but the evil one is using those thoughts to tempt me. And the opponents of the world of flesh and devil, the world of flesh and devil may tempt us in various ways, do evil, discourage us from doing good. Okay? It's not only doing evil, but not doing good. That, that's the omission, huh? The omission of sins. I think, I, I'd really like you to, for you to pray about that, the omission of sins, because I don't think we really think of that very often. 
Although all Christians face temptations and intimidations, we can be victorious. We call on Christ's help. Use the aids given the church. The aids are the sacraments, the aids are, the, are prayer, the aids of community, calling people into responsibility, parents calling uh, uh, children into forming their character. You know, God is not more concerned about our comfort. He's more concerned about our character. And so that's going to be a little bit of hard knocks every so often, tough love every so often. That's okay because our character is what we're going to take to heaven. That's our destiny, how we're formed in Christ. So let's uh, take a look at what are the opponents of the great marriage. Now you should know this. You have the world. You have the flesh, and what is the last? Don't give him too much credit, the devil. Yeah. So, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna pray this, pray this incredible prayer to end up, and this prayer is a, is a battle cry, huh? We got people on our side, we got angels on our side, we got the guardian angels, we got the heavenly choirs, we got the archangels, and we got St. Michael. So don't think you're alone in all this battle. You know, the spiritual battle, sometimes we think, of, oh man, I just feel so much alone. You're not alone. First of all, you're a Christian community. When one suffers, all suffers. When one rejoices, all rejoices, Paul says. So let's just pray this prayer from our heart and recognize the spiritual battle we're in. Now, some people are really struggling right now. There's a watching. People have really a deep spiritual a battle in their life. It could be something that's from the past, a, a lie that they've lived. It could be a sin. It could be, it could be a sinful act. It could be just a brokenness, a, a weakness that has, has really captured their, their lives, their marriage. And I just ask you, you know, pray with me for the healing of Christ uh, in this. And through, through, through Lent, pray for healing. Um, so let's just turn to St. Michael to instruct us on how in a way to fight this battle because he's, he's the captain of, of the guard. He's the leader of the army. So in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Holy Michael, the archangel, defend us the day of battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the enemy. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast down to hell Satan and all the evil spirits who wander through the world seeking the ruin of souls. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.